We're back, it's 11.30, so we should probably get started. Okay, I see people coming in, but if we can get the slides for the APNEPC report. Okay, I'll, I'll go through the EC report uh, as the EC chair. Uh, I think, okay. Uh, as we went through the morning, uh, these are the members of the EC. Uh, we are missing two of them on the stage here, but uh, myself, I'm Gaurab. Uh, Rajesh is uh, the secretary. Kenny is our treasurer. Uh, Benjamin is a uh, member, so is Izumi, Jessica, and Camps. And further, we have uh, Rajesh, uh, uh, Paul, as the ex officio member, uh, as the director general. Uh, the bylaws of APNIC lays out very clearly the functions of the APNIC EC. Uh, the function of the APNIC ECs are to represent the interests of members in the governance of APNIC, uh, oversight of APNIC's uh, secretariat activities, uh, consider the broad policy issues uh, around the internet and APNIC strategic direction, uh, and imp very important set membership fees, and also support the community by endorsing uh, the policy consensus and sending it towards implementation. Uh, that does mean that uh, sometimes we do send those uh, policy that reach consensus back if uh, it has uh, adverse effect uh, or conflicts with one of these other functions of the EC. The APNIC EC meetings, uh, it's held four times a year in uh, person, face-to-face. -face. Uh, we have had uh, five face-to-face uh, -face meetings since uh, the last AGM uh, in APNIC 45. Um, we had a joint board meeting with uh, LACNIC in December. Uh, which was also one of the four face-to-face -face, uh, meetings of the APNIC EC. Uh, we are planning to have a joint uh, board interaction with the uh, ICANN board uh, in two weeks' time. Uh, the next APNIC me EC meeting will be in June in Brisbane at the office. It's a bit longer than usual because uh, at the next meeting, uh, we're planning to, like it's basically in our cycle of planning, uh, we do that every four years. And this year uh, is time to do that uh, four year strategic plan. So we'll spend more than your regular scheduled time uh, going through that in June. And then that process will continue with the staff uh, conference and you know, by the end of the year in December when we have the 
last meeting of the year, we will endorse and publish the four-year strategic plan. All of the minutes of the meeting um, and the schedule and the attendance of the board members, of the EC members, are uh, on the APNIC EC website, apnic.net uh, slash EC. We had a perfect uh, attendance record uh, in the last uh, 12 months. Um, okay, so uh, important things. Uh, what, what were the, one of the most important things in uh, 2018 uh, was uh, the APNIC uh, survey. Uh, the survey is done every two years uh, and it is commissioned uh, on behalf of the uh, EC. It is uh, done by an independent third party. Uh, we've used this company called Survey Matters in Australia for the last uh, two surveys. Uh, it gathers uh, feedbacks from our members and the community about APNIC uh, performance, priorities, and future activities. And it's a good thing that it, the survey, we take, when we do this and strategic planning, we take the input from the survey uh, for our long-term planning. And the survey also fits into how we do budgeting and things like that on an annual basis. Uh, the survey report is online. Uh, we talked quite extensively about it at the last meeting in Numia when it was released. Uh, but the survey continues to be a, you know, an important tool for the EC uh, and the Secretariat to take the feedback from the community at large. Uh, because despite the multiple meetings and a large number of engagement, uh, with our members, uh, the su survey provides sort of a report card and future activity guidelines uh, for the EC. Um, and obviously the 2018 APNIC survey uh, results will guide our strategic planning activity for the next uh, four years. Finances, uh, we just uh, talked about the finances before the break. Um, all good uh, so far. Um, as of the end of 2018, we had uh, 7,162 members. Uh, in 2018, we had an operating surplus. Uh, revenue over budget and expenses are below budget, uh, which is always a good thing. Uh, we had a total surplus of Australian dollars, 1.11 million. Uh, we approved uh, the auditor's uh, report uh, for 2018, so the audited financial reports for the last year are now available on the website. Um, we also approved the activity plan for 2019 along with the budget for 2019. Um, and uh, we continue to discuss uh, the direction around fees and what other things we can do. Um, Obviously, as earlier said, one of the important functions is uh, policy endorsement and implementation. Uh, we reviewed and resolved um, one policy proposal uh, in the last one year, or at least after the last meeting, uh, which was the validation of abused mailbox uh, and other IRT emails, uh, Prop 125. Uh, thanks to everyone who participated in that, and especially thanks to the six chairs who uh, separated that policy through the process. Uh, and our NC and ASOAC, we, uh, every year we uh, appoint uh, one member to each of these two, uh, oh, to appoint one member to the NRO NC, uh, which is also the ASOAC. Um, and uh, we appointed Simon uh, Boroi uh, to the NRO Number Council for a one-year term starting beginning of this year to the end of this year. Uh, we have three representatives on the ASOAC. Um, two of them are elected and one of them is nominated. Uh, currently we have Aftab Siddiqui and Brajesh Jain as the elected members and Simon as the nominated members. Uh, also, for the last term, or well, at present, AFTAV continues to chair the ASOAC. Um, for those of you who followed through the INA transition uh, discussions in the earlier part of the decade, 
uh, one of the outcomes of that was uh, creation of a INA review committee. Um, and as I said earlier today, um, we decided that we are going to, you know, invite community members to be part of that. And we set up a procedure for elections uh, similar to what we do with the ASOAC. Um, so we appointed uh, Jul Fadli Saim from, uh, uh, from Bali to the INA Review Committee for a two-year term starting at the beginning of this year to the end of next year. Uh, APNIC representation to the RC is now uh, three of them. Baton, he's elected uh, in the recent meeting in Numia. Uh, and then uh, we have Jul and then supplemented and supported by George Kuo from the APNIC staff. And this, this was the agreed structure of the RC was each of the RIRs will nominate two community, two community members and one staff member. And we've taken that and we've uh, elected Susan to go through the election route for one of them and then gone through the nomination for the other one and uh, designated George from the APNIC staff uh, for the RC. The other activity we undertook uh, in the last years was uh, Actually, you know, sort of background to this was uh, for the last uh, two years uh, or multiple years, uh, the APNIC election results had been a bit problematic for the apricot closing ceremony, uh, as in the sense that as we uh, take longer and more people get engaged, the time we allocate for vote counting and everything just keeps on taking longer and our closing ceremony keeps on getting delayed and, you know, all sorts of repercussions after that. Uh, so we have been looking at uh, the evaluating a fully electronic uh, voting system uh, for the members to uh, use so that we don't have to deal with a lot of papers. Uh, the guidance we gave was uh, the voting system should be reliable and not susceptible to any kind of interference and trusted by both APNIC members and the broader internet community. So the secretary is going through multiple evaluations, looking at other RIRs and similar internet bodies, and is going to prepare a report around this for consideration by the EC. Um, this is new. We started doing something again, this uh, service partner trial, uh, for the lack of a better term. Uh, this was one of the feedback not from the 2018 survey, but from the 2016 survey. Uh, we had asked if, what do the members want? And a lot of feedback was we want local, bigger, broader engagement because there were issues, mostly logistics and administrative where people were not able to engage with APNIC in terms of paying fees because of government regulations or getting localized support and a bunch of other issues. And obviously, you know, we can't really set up offices everywhere. So we... Uh, started this, we engaged a bunch of outside consultants from the early year, multiple models, and we approached this service partner model. Um, we started uh, a result to approve the service partner trial. So before we go full board with it, we approved the trial with improving the support of new APNIC members according to local needs. Uh, we've signed off three partners so far, uh, the Nepal Research Network, the Malaysia Network Operators Group, Minog, and the Philippine Cable uh, TV Association. So these have all signed in. Uh, the Nepalians signed in a bit early last year, and they have actually been onboarded. The other two are still getting onboarded and starting to get to work. Um, we'll continue, the pilot will continue and be uh, evaluated by the EC and secretariat by the end of 2019 and see whether this has been effective and what other, uh, you know, rules we'll need to set for it to be successful or change or so, so on. Uh, so this will be a new approach. And as uh, we get results from the pilot, you know, you'll see more content about this model on the website uh, for everybody to see. Okay, towards the end, uh, we welcome all members' feedback. Uh, there are multiple ways. Uh, you can contact from the APNIC website, 
obviously we have the face-to-face -face meetings, we had the meet the EC last night, uh, and uh, if you go to the website and go to the EC page, there is a special button which says meet the EC or feed, contact the EC. And you also can go and contact the EC from the My EP NIC. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'll actually take questions on this if you have any uh, after we go through the policy SIG report because we have an open mic uh, at that time. Uh, so, SIG Chair, Sumun Bhai, uh, policy SIG Chair, uh, I can do the SIG report next. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I will uh, present the policy report. Happened, uh, the policy meeting happened yesterday. Uh, it was a busy schedule, and uh, we have a lot of proposals to discuss. And it started with the six-year election. And the chair position was uh, uh, open for election. And there is a, only candidate. It was me, and, and I am re-elected again. In the last meeting, uh, we have abandoned one proposal, Prop 118. It was uh, for discussion for more than a year, no need policy in the Epic region. It didn't discuss consciousness in the other meeting, and the author didn't come up with any revised version, and there was no support from the community. So we are abandoning this proposal in this meeting. And then we have a implementation update, uh, Prop 125, and uh, it is now in implementation phase, and first phase is uh, estimated to complete in June 2019, and the second phase is estimated to complete by December 2019. It is about validation of abuse mailbox and other IIT emails. And there are two informational presentations, uh, one by Jody Pallet regarding some modification proposal on transfer policy, uh, inter IR or inter IR transfer policy. And uh, then uh, there's an interesting presentation by Jeff Houston on unadvertised address space. Hope this presentation will lead to some new effective policies in the upcoming meetings. And uh, we have passed, uh, uh, this year actually we just changed the format a bit. There is a proposal readout. The policy proposers actually stated their, why they have proposed it and uh, what the solution they proposed to the main session to help the audience get a clear view about the proposals. I hope it helped out and we are trying to improve the policy development process and more easy for the participant and we encourage more people to participate in the policy development process. And this year actually we have passed three proposal rich consensus. One of them is Prop 129, abolishing waiting list for unmet IPv4 request. It's basically abolishing the waiting list from the recovered pool. So all the recovered address, if any, will go to the, uh, will follow the same policy as the last flash 8, 103 slash 8, and it reached consensus in the OPM. May I request chair for a consensus call here for this proposal in the AVM? Uh, yep, you can call for it and I can just ask the audience. Thank so I'll, I'll ask the chair to once again uh, call uh, for the consensus so, call in the AMM, please. So proposal one to nine, abolish waiting list for unmet IPv4 IP request. It reached consensus in the open policy meeting. So i like to have a consensus call that uh, here in the members meeting that uh, do support this proposal I think what Sunwa is saying is uh, we'll do a simple one. I'll, I'll do it the opposite way. Is if anybody is in opposition to this proposal, Craig, I see you looking at me. I think that is the way we'll do it. Is just say this uh, this proposal has reached consensus uh, in the uh, earlier in the week, 
And I think we've heard comments about how this uh, double approvals uh, is a bit time consuming and not so. Um, we, we can just do a call and see if uh, anybody has any opposition to this uh, proposal first. Any, any opposition to the proposal? Uh, 129, which reached consensus in the policy SIG, to abolish the waiting list for unmet IPv4 requests. One, two, three. I said there is no opposition, so we should say the proposal is uh, risk consensus, and consensus was not opposed. Uh, so we take it that it's risk consensus in the AMM. Thank you. Thank you. So proposal one to nine, risk consensus in the AMM. So let's move to the next proposal, prop one to eight, multi-homing not required for ASN. In the earlier policies, that there's a requirement. So those requesting for AS should be multi-homed, but uh, this proposal actually says that uh, anyone, any organization, they can do it, request ASN without the multi-home requirement. And this proposal also raised consensus in the open policy meeting. And now it's here after consensus again. Uh, yes, right. Akin uh Thank you. Um, I'd like to clarify that the, the status reached consensus in open policy meeting is mm -hmm. an accurate expression or not. I think policy SIG, in policy SIG, uh, doesn't make sense much more than uh, in OPM. It, it, in the word OPM is in uh, some, uh, according to the stipulation in some document or something? Uh, I, I think I agree with Akinuri san. I think the status on the slide should be changed to Sunny to just the risk consensus in the policy sake. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll correct that. So, prop one to each, multi homing not required for ASN. Okay, uh, again, uh, same process as earlier. Uh, this policy risk consensus in the policy sake. Uh, I'll call to see if there is any opposition to it at the AMM. Calling once, calling twice, calling thrice. I think the consensus is maintained in the AMM, so we'll take it as, uh, now we can say it is just consensus in the OPM, uh, not before this. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So let's move to the next proposal. Prop 127. Change maximum delegation size of 103 slash 8 IPv4 address pool to a slash 23, changing from slash 22 to slash 23. It also raised consensus in the policy SIG meeting. Okay, this uh, one uh, I'll call for um, uh, the maintaining the consensus. If uh, there is any opposition to this um, policy being uh, passed, uh, Time is now to raise your hands. Uh, calling for consensus maintenance. One, two, three. I think we can say this as risk consensus. Now, now that we have risk consensus, actually there is more action here. Uh, this particular policy actually impacts how we uh, work with our members. Um, and how they get allocation. But as for our PDP, we have another, uh, how many weeks? Four weeks. Four, Four weeks, weeks of comment period to pass this policy finally. Um, we, when this policy reached consensus in the policy sake, the EC met uh, to discuss this issue. And so we made a decision and resolution of the EC, um, which is conditional uh, decision, which I will um, kind of read, read it out. Um, now that community consensus has been reached for, on Prop 127, the policy proposal will enter the usual call for comment period lasting four weeks before the proposal can become policy. As a result, the APNIC EC announces that an interim arrangement for IPv4 address delegation from the last class eight or the 103 slash eight will now be in place, effective immediately from um, Wow, it's just midday, uh, 12 uh, p.m. on uh, February 28, uh, 2019. During this period, um, that is starting now, um, until the proposal is uh, 
fully endorsed by the EC and sent to implementation uh, or is rejected on the, on the last call uh, and we don't have to implement it, any new V4 request uh, we get for a slash 22 will be processed according to the new proposal to a maximum of slash 23. So we, when we receive new requests, they'll just, you know, be, we assume that the new policy is in place. However, um, we still have time to debate this for four weeks, and uh, if the policy, you know, just to be careful, uh, an additional slash 23 will be reserved for the applicant that qualifies for a slash 22 under existing policy. Uh, and before you ask, yes, we'll try to make it the adjacent slash 23 uh, whenever possible um, for the particular uh, request. If uh, Prop 127 is rejected at the end of the comment period, uh, IFINIC will delegate the reserved slash 23 to the applicants to make it a slash 22 or provide a total of slash 22 of address space. If Prop 127 becomes a PNIC policy, and comes up for uh, full EC endorsement, the reserved address space will be made available for allocation to other applicants uh, as uh, not usual. So, as I mentioned, uh, this takes Im effect immediately. Uh, well, it's been in effect for one minute already. Um, <laughs> those requests for an uh, allocation from the last class eight, <coughs> 103 slash eight, received prior to this announcement, will be processed under the then policy. Uh, so anything received now onwards, as in like from a one minute ago, uh, will follow this policy. But, you know, just in case the policy doesn't reach full consensus, uh, we'll reserve a slash 23 next to it uh, until that period. Um, is there any questions on this? Okay, someone you can continue. Thank you. Thank you. So we have another proposal discussed, Prop 126, uh, about PDP update. There, are, uh, in several areas, there are the requests for update for the PDP, but uh, uh, it didn't reach consensus in the policy meeting. So forward it to the mailing list, if others want to continue, and uh, getting from feedback from the community. And we have another proposal discussed, Prop 124, clarification of IPv6 sub assignments. And this proposal also didn't reach consensus in the policy SIG and forward to the mailing list. And that's from the, all from the policy report. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Simon. Bhai. If you'd wait, uh, we do have an open mic uh, around the policy issues or anything else uh, around uh, the topic of uh, resource policy or address policy uh, right now. Uh, if you have anything, uh, well, uh, we still are on the topic of policies. Also, I should remind, we have live uh, streaming and online participation, so let's check if there are any comments online as well. Um, Uh, I was expecting a little bit more fireworks here um, after the policy uh, uh, session. Uh, I guess, uh, oh, I see someone standing up, so that's good. Hi, Aftab Siddiqui. Sorry, I had to wear my shoes. So uh, if I may, so this was discussed uh, in the policy discussions. Um, during the PDP update policy. Um, and shared by a few that the policy discussion has become quite uh, uninteresting somehow. And uh, when I presented my policy, I, I, I wouldn't call it a promise, I call it a commitment to some extent that I'm not coming back for any policy ever again. And the thing is, uh, we need more people from the community to come up with ideas. So what are we missing um, in the policy discussions? There's less and less engagement. Um, still the focus is uh, around IPv4 and IPv6. We heard so many things about uh, routing security. 
there is a lot uh, we can do in the routing security space. The last time we did uh, the WHOIS validation uh, was absolutely other than the IPv4 and IPv6 and ASN. So there are, there are some focus area where we can uh, try and engage with the community and come up with better ideas. And my suggestion would be to open up the policy SIG more or create more SIG which can help create the <coughs> discussion in the community. Um, I don't know what the solution is, but I would like to hear from the EC and uh, from the policy SIG chair that what can be the solution. Because whether we like it or not, we need a solution. Otherwise, it will be too late. Thank you, Aftab. Um, I feel like I need to go down there and start speaking my mind a bit more again. Uh, but Suman Bhai, what, what do you think? I think this issue has come up, uh, and I would like to hear from my fellow EC members if you have any comments or from the members of our community here uh, and uh, as well as the six chairs. Not so much. I, I do agree with, uh, I see Sunny getting up. Remote comments, Sunny, or? Uh, Sunny from uh, APNIC. Uh, so I just want to uh, read out the policy SIG charter. The policy SIG charter is to develop policies and procedures which relate to the management and use of internet address resources by APNIC, NIRs, and ISPs within the Asia Pacific region. So it is pretty much open uh, to what uh, Aftab suggested um, to have other discussions in the policy SIG. Yes, I think Kenny uh, has something to say. Thank you, Chani. Uh, Sunny, to clarify the charter of policy six. Actually, the policy six itself is pretty open. And because I remember in the previous time, we have database six. But eventually, there is no sufficient discussion in the database six. So most of the related issue, like who is database requirement, moved to the policy as we discussed in the previous uh, policy meeting. So relate to, to routing security, probably uh, right now, probably uh, I'm not sure whether we should create another complete new, new uh, special interest group or just temporary merge to the policy. Sake. And once it gets more momentum on the routing policy, we can separate into uh, individual SIG. That's my recommendation. Thank you, Kenny. Uh, Izumi? Yes, um, I'd like to echo what Kenny has mentioned and maybe a way to distinguish um, uh, creating a separate SIG or not would be to um, whether APNIC needs to implement what's being suggested regarding a topic. So if it's something related to routing and RPKI, it's something that APNIC has to implement. Something related to database, who is that APNIC needs to implement, I think, you know, we can certainly be open to have it dis have discussions in policy SIG. But if it's something that's just more of a general technical topic that nothing for APNIC to implement, maybe it's worth um, setting up a separate SIG if there are substantial needs for from the community to discuss this uh, in a focused manner. I'll we'll start with the both. After. Yes, sir. Aftab Siddiqui again. Thank you, uh, Kenny and Izumi, for um, highlighting that one. So just want to share one last point. What I'm missing from last couple of uh, uh, APNIC meetings, whether it is during the APRICOT or standalone APNIC meetings, is secretariat, secretariat's involvement in updating the community about the problems they are facing or uh, the help desk coming up saying, well, this is the, this is the issue we are facing and we need your support to resolve the issue. Um, and uh, it's us coming up, coming up with the solution for the problem which we see as a problem. Probably it is not. That's why there were a few uh, policy proposals which were not accepted. So uh, maybe a more involvement from the, uh, um, from the Secretariat. And uh, just like we have in few other regions, um, like policy shepherds or something like that, where we can 
um, engage with the community, find out what problem they think they are having uh, on region and sub-region basis, uh, and even on country level. If, if you have some problem, um, then why not? If there is some uh, correlation between the policies and the NIRs, because every NIR has their own policy, is, is there any correlation between the, between the those policy? If we can get some feedback from those community, it would be interesting. And I, I don't see any connectivity between the uh, JPNIC and TWNIC has been coming up and with great ideas, but there are more NIRs. Why don't we hear from them at all? So um, Aaron has been participating quite extensively for quite some time. So I, I, as I said, I don't have a solution, but I need, uh, I need a solution being part of this community for 13, 14 years now. So any help would be appreciated. I see Akinori and Paul uh, and Sanjay. Do you want to go? Thank you very much. Akinori Maimura from JPNIC. Uh, uh, after me is a very good point. And then uh, we at JPNIC has the quite similar mechanism uh, with the, the APNIC's uh, policy SIG. Uh, we, we call that as the JPNIC open policy meeting. And then where we have the policy discussion but in an uh, open on the bottom up uh, manner. And then uh, what we are trying very hard is how to synchronize and have, uh, have the, the, these two policies at the APNIC and the JPNIC consistent uh, with each other. So uh, that, that kind of the effort um, could be more understood uh, throughout, throughout the community. Then uh, that's, that's your suggestion after. Uh, as, 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 I, as I get, then uh, I, I will try to uh, some, have some explanation to the AP, APNIC arena, uh, what is JPNIC, uh, what JPNIC is doing for this regard. Thank you very much for, the, for your suggestion. Good point. Uh, Paul Wilson here. I'm, I'm very glad to hear um, this topic being raised, so thank you, Aftab. Um, I have to say, I don't think it's entirely true that we have less and less participation. I think this policy seek this time was fairly quiet and, it's, and it is disappointing when, uh, when efforts have been made to, to put um, uh, policies to the community and there really is so, so little discussion. So I don't, I don't blame anyone for being a bit disappointed with that. But I think uh, over the last couple of years we've made efforts and the, the efforts have actually um, succeeded to some extent to bring more uh, participation, more awareness and more proposals uh, into the system from interested members of the community. So we might, we might gather some stats and kind of really look at that, that objectively just so that we have a common view of what the, uh, what the status is at the moment. Um, but I've reflected a bit on this uh, at this meeting and previously and, and at APNIC we've got a very hands-off approach to the policy process and we really don't enter into the into this discussions. In one or two, at least one or two other RIRs, there's a, um, there's a role of a policy analyst, which we don't have at APNIC. We more have a policy, policy administration. Um, but perhaps uh, it would be a useful thing to define a policy analyst role at APNIC to have a staff member who would comment on or provide inputs on uh, objectively on any matters in connection with policies, policy implementations, problems we might have. The, the idea would not be to advocate for any policy, perhaps to advocate for the need for solutions to issues or to, and to comment objectively. That's, a, that's actually quite different by my understanding, for instance, from the Aaron Advisory Committee role. The Advisory Committee members actually do play a much more active role in shepherding and even advocating for policies, but those, uh, but that is not a staff role, that, that's a role that's um, given to an elected community representative, which would be quite different from the policy analyst role, which is a more objective, um, purely objective scientific kind of commentary role, but it's definitely a role that's more engaged in discussion about policies at that level. And, and to me, it, that may be uh, a direction that, uh, that we should take at a staff level without breaching any of the new sort of neutrality and independence kind of requirements that we really have felt very strong uh, over the years and I think are still uh, absolutely important. Thanks. Sanjay? Uh, yes, uh, Sanjay from APNIC. Um, I'd like to also raise the possibility that uh, it just occurred to me from the 
uh, policy discussion uh, that the younger community actually don't use email that much anymore. So having the policy discussion in the mailing list, uh, you know, may be suitable for <laughs> people like us. Uh, but uh, I think it's true that, that uh, you don't see people now use mail a lot anymore and may need some more uh, immediate communication channel. So I'm, I'm just thinking whether we should explore along that line to somehow broadcast it to different type of media as well that fits the community. So if, if WeChat is popular in China, that's what we're going to do, to, to use in Facebook, in, in Philippines, then let's use that. So basically, be a bit more creative in, in, in the mechanism to have this discussion. It's just an idea. Thank you, Sanjay. I hope you are not advocating policy proposals be limited to 140 characters. <laughs> uh, I see Simon up there. Sorry, I'm only on my socks. Uh, 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 I really congratulate the policy chairs and the co-chairs for a nice job. Um, I'm not so disappointed like after Bai. I'm pretty hopeful with the policies. Uh, but I want to really request to the EC that why don't you do something like outreach program? Eptic is connected with the so many NOGs, and in every NOGs we can do some outreach. In the NOGs we always see the technical things. So the, those technical guys, like Sanjay told, the young guys doesn't want to come to the policy. So I'll request to the EC to so have an outreach program for the policy. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. I think uh, Izumi has something to add. Yes. Uh, excellent suggestion, Simon. Um, inspired by AFTAP's observation that uh, there are some NIRs who are actually having their own policy forum, but we don't really hear much about it. So, um, and I also observe the same situation. So, having some kind of somebody, voluntary maybe, um, who would actually outreach not just the NIRs, but anyone who's willing to share within their country or sub-region about the discussions that's happening in the APNIC region would certainly help people understand the proposals being discussed. That's one point, and maybe we can start with that as a start. And then as a second step, it would be really nice if those coordinators or volunteers, somebody who helps in the outreach can actually bring back the feedback that's being discussed in their country or sub-region to the APNIC region. Um, so that might be something that we may consider um, and as a start, outreach would be a really good thing, uh, rather than try to do everything at once. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Isumi. I think I'll, I'll just... May I come? Yes. Yeah. So, I, I really like the idea of up top data bringing a few issues actually to discussion, and some definitely fit in the policy discussion, and if we can correlate policies with uh, operational issues, then actually it gets, you will get more engagement. Even uh, if I recall the earlier experience, maybe back in 2005, where I first attended the EPNIC meeting, and I enjoyed EPNIC court and EPNIC policy meeting, I was really kind of lost. And then it took a few years to actually engage with the community. So, uh, uh, what uh, uh, we are even in, in the, if we outreach is one issue, that is uh, uh, to get more engagement and engage more young people, maybe we try a new approach, as Sanjay has mentioned. and. Uh, in fact, in, in local NOG, BIDNOG, we tried to discuss some policy issues and we found that there are people actually, if they understand, if they correlate, then actually you, you, will, you will see more engagement. And uh, that's how actually we can uh, get uh, more community feedback. And another thing we could do, what we, I, we're watching from, especially from Japan, that before every EPNIC meeting, we're getting concrete feedback from Japanese community on every individual proposals. So. Uh, we are from different economy, and in our country, we can, if we do the similar practice, then actually we can get more people engaging with the policy. So I think it's uh, not a single solution. Uh, if we try out n different options, and then we'll see more engagement and more vibrant discussion, and that will help our community more. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, thank you, Simon Bai. Um, 
I think we had some good discussion. Uh, we're kind of uh, starting to come to the time. If, if I'm not, if I would summarize this, I think there is a general agreement that we need to uh, enlarge the discussions at the policy sake, but have been cautioned that it can't just be another technical session, but it has to be enlarged to uh, in, include things that are primary APNIC businesses. So things that are related with our registry function, and which I think I can agree with, is uh, uh, we call our policy say address policy say, even though it is not explicit, that's what it is implied. Um, I do think that calling it the registration, you know, or I don't know, the lack of right term, uh, registry and uh, address policy uh, SIG probably is uh, not extending the scope too much or going out of the scope. Um, and as uh, Kenny pointed out a long time ago, we used to have other SIGs where some of these things were discussed and we uh, sorted down because they did not have enough business to discuss. Like we had the database SIG that shut down the IX SIG uh, kind of morphed into what is now EPIX and the peering forum. They didn't really shut down, but they kind of uh, went out of scope. Uh, so I think we, we can definitely explore with the, and then I invite the SIG chairs to, I don't know if it is a communication thing or just enlarging the discussion to be not just IP address policies, but also registration related which uh, obviously includes things like RDAP, um, RPKI, um, and anything that impacts the registry operation and the accuracy of the registry database. Because, uh, you know, I see APNIC as two functions. One is as the custodian of the IP address resources or address resources, and the, the way we act as custodians is we aim to man manage and maintain a accurate registry. And I think those two are core functions. And uh, so I think that's where we would look at and, and maybe we'll uh, ask our comps team, uh, Tony, I'm looking at you to see uh, how do we use something like Twitter for policy discussion, you know, uh, and so on and so forth. So all those uh, taken in. Uh, and I, I, I'm supposed to go to the next one, but Mamira san you have the last right. word here. All right, thank you very much. That's that's very good discussion for uh, you know for us to improve our own process to be effective in terms of the development of the policy or some other business with the APNIC. I yes, that's thank you very much, Gaurav, to put up the history of our activity. We had uh, multiple SIGs, and then uh, they were shut down. Then, in the, the, uh, in the course of that discussion, we had some uh, observation that uh, if we had the multiple SIG, I don't know, my, um, my point is that uh, anyhow, the policy SIG is the main, uh, main arena for us to discuss something. Then, uh, uh, even if we had uh, another, another SIG and uh, have something discussed there, uh, that, uh, that gains a lot of, uh, at, it doesn't gain a lot of audience and uh, participa participation from, from the you know, entire APNI community, then you know, uh, the all things related to the policy should have been discussed in uh, uh, policy SIG. That's, a, that's one of the development we had. So uh, I, I, I was reminded that, that kind of the discussion uh, before then. Uh, that that's, uh, should be taken into account. But uh, let's discuss and uh, let's revisit our process uh, and uh, get it better. Thank you very much. Uh, th thank you, Akinori. Uh, so unless you have anything to add, I think uh, we can continue this discussion, but uh, as I said, during the lunch break and others, we can still continue to talk about it. Uh, I would, you know, also encourage uh, those who have, are from other RIR regions uh, and folks with a longer experience in uh, engagement uh, in the community to contribute uh, to the discussion. And obviously the EC members are quite visible here, but also before I ask someone why to leave, can I ask our two policy co-chairs to kind of raise? 
Ching Hang, and where is Bertrand? There. Ching Heng. Ching Heng. Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you. Right? Thank yeah. you so much, Bai. Thank you. Thank you for the nice discussion. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, we have a report on the NIR SIG. Uh, we have the newly elected chair, Billy. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Billy with the Korea Internet and Security Agency. Um, I will brief uh, about NIR National Internet Registry SIG, which happened uh, um, last, uh, oh, this, right? Um, this, uh, this Tuesday, uh, we had a meeting about half an hour, and participants was about 45. Before, the, before we discuss uh, uh, agenda, we had the election, chair election. Um, Co-chair Jenny from CNX served as the acting chair this meeting. And there was an uh, uh, NIRC election conducted by um, APNIC secretariat. And Billy Chun, myself, was elected unopposed. Uh, new year, uh, new chair will serve uh, a two-year term. Next agenda. Um, every seven uh, NIRs made an uh, update, and also uh, APNIC Secretariat uh, uh, gave update new features in core registry services and related uh, uh, services. First update was made by Tim Wong from TWNIC. TWNIC has uh, 246 members and uh, 132,190 uh, IPv4 and 2,455 uh, IPv6 blocks. And main activities was uh, um, last year they had the 31st open policy meeting and the second uh, no meeting and provided a workshop for members about uh, routing and RPKI. And it was highlighted that Taiwan IPv6 user availability grew rapidly in last year. And this year, uh, they will uh, host the IPv6 train, uh, provide V6 training and activities. And next, um, CNIC update was uh, uh, made by Yu Dong Zhang. Um, and statistics was uh, uh, they have members uh, of uh, 1,395 and 331,000 uh, uh, IPv4 and 16,000 slash uh, uh, IPv6 blocks. And they have a long-term uh, IPv6 national uh, according uh, national action plan. And according to this plan, uh, IPv6 implementation is going well, and they also provide uh, um, trainings for local members about IPv6 and RPKI. And most of the government websites support IPv4 and IPv6. Uh, they will, this year, they will uh, focus on v 6 promotion and RPKI deployment and IP system upgrade. Next, uh, VNIC update was uh, made by uh, Wan Ng Wen. Uh, they have uh, 382 members and they have uh, um, 62,000, about 62,000 V4 and 51 V6. And main activity is, was uh, RPKI training and also uh, training uh, about uh, routing. Um, and they are collaborating, uh, actively collaborating with uh, other uh, NIRs. Um, JPNIC participated uh, uh, for RPKI training and also uh, APNIC, uh, you know, uh, take part in routing training. And they also have a national IPv6 action plan. And uh, according to APNIC lab, uh, their uh, IPv6 use reached at 33.74%, which is uh, uh, second uh, ASEAN. 
and third in APNIC region and eighth in the world. Next RN update was uh, made by Abhishek Gautam and they have uh, 2,677 members. They have uh, uh, about 42,000 uh, IPv4, 5.3 billion uh, slash 6 IPv6. They, had, uh, uh, they hosted the fourth open policy meeting and there was uh, uh, many, um, lots of informational sessions and their uh, local community was briefed about APNIC policies and PDP. And next, uh, JPNIC uh, update was made by Hiroshi Kawabata-san. Um, JPNIC has uh, 439 members and has uh, 3,091 uh, 3, um, V4 addresses and 7,251 V6 blocks. Uh, main active, they host uh, JPNIC as leading country, uh, you know, in IPv6, pro, uh, IPv6. They hosted the V6 pro summit and also provided a RPKI and 35th, and they also hosted the 35th open policy meeting and they, uh, uh, they collaborated, uh, um, they are helping other, P other NIRs uh, uh, actively. And lastly, they, uh, they, they are going to host uh, ICANN 64 in Gobe, um, March 9th uh, to 14th, which is next week. Hope uh, some of you can attend it because it's a neighboring country. And next. Uh, is a uh, yes chaotic update that was made by myself and we have uh, 271 members and we have a uh, 4030 um, v4 addresses and 5000 about 5000 v6 address and we uh, up, we active uh, we are checking uh, we try to uh, update uh, update who is information with APNI and also we had a RDAP test uh, internally uh, last year and also uh, trying to pro, uh, implement IPv6. And another thing I want uh, you know, share with other NIRs is uh, Kealik was, uh, you know, uh, was has, has, had, had been located in Seoul for last two decades and uh, we, are, we are going to move to certain part, the most certain part of uh, uh, Korea, which is called Naju, uh, according to government plan in this year. So I think it keeps us uh, busy and it's quite a, a challenging job. And next, uh, uh, APSI uh, IDNIC update by uh, Mohamed Andri. Uh, they have uh, 15, uh, 1,000 590 members and uh, they hosted the first uh, um, <clears throat> annual member meeting and provided uh, actively uh, workshops for members and uh, they are focusing on system and who is improvement. And they are going to have a CA root server uh, in this year and also implement RPKI. So actually, we didn't have much time uh, to discuss this. Uh, it, this topic was taken to NIL Tech Workshop, but uh, we, uh, you know, um, George Microsoft from Secretariat uh, shared uh, the new features uh, of a core registry and related services, and NIL uh, shared their situation, and uh, I find uh, uh, it is difficult to, for all, all NIRs to implement uh, these new features at the same time because uh, you know, NIRs are uh, uh, in different situation. I mean, uh, different situation. But uh, since we are in uh, a good mood of collaboration, uh, we, can, we need to still uh, communicate and we can achieve the goal uh, in the near future. So, photo taken, and I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Billy. Uh, I'd also uh, like to thank, um, uh, thank Jen Yu, uh, who's the co-chair and uh, took the mantle uh, in the last six months. Uh, can I see Jen? 
is here. He was here earlier. Okay. Maybe I should warn them that they might be called. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, thanks to Billy and thanks to the co chairs of the NIRC. Thank you, Billy. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, we'll have the co president SIG uh, report by Dr. Govind. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I am presently the Chair of this Corporation SIG, along with the Vikram Sestra, the Co-Chair. So in the beginning of the Cooperation SIG meeting, we had an election for the chair. Uh, four nominations were received by the secretariat, Dr. Rajesh R., myself, Joy Chan, Venkat Raman. APNIC secretariat conducted the Cooperation SIG chair election. Joy Chan was elected by higher number of count of votes. Uh, we have Joy Chan here. Can you stand up? So, we congratulate her for assuming the new position. New chair will serve as a two-year term beginning next APNIC meeting. So, now the agenda for the, this cooperation SIG meeting, the theme was the internet content blocking and filtering, challenges and the way forward. I made the welcoming remarks, Vikram Sestra, co-chair made the status in Nepal. Akinori Mamura <coughs> had a case study of what happened in the Japan recently. Sumon Ahmed Sabir made a presentation on the technical approach, how, what is the feasibility of this kind of content blocking. Rajneesh Singh from ISOC made a wider point on the education, educating the government. And Satish Babu made a presentation from the and perspective, perspective. So setting up the context for this internet content blocking and filtering, there is an enormous amount of content creation in all facets of human activities which is going on in the political, economic, entertainment sectors. And this also triggered a kind of fake news, hate speeches, malicious and abusive content. As we all know, internet is an open, globally connected, and needs no permission to communicate and create innovative applications and content. So that is the challenge now, because on the one side, the privacy and protectionism is a in challenge, and on the other side, the law enforcement agencies are looking for a security and receiving this kind of data. So this session basically dealt with these speakers so what kind of content needs to flow in these platforms? Which type needs to be blocked, filtered, and what should be the norms and policies at all which you have to develop? So Bikram Sestra, we made the, uh, what happened, what is happening in Nepal. They are presently, ISPs and NSPs have different types of challenges like no judicial authorization, overarching orders from the ministry, no data protection laws, transparent mechanism for blocking or filtering, provision of notice and take down in the law. There is a need to have an effective policy in consultation with individuals from all stakeholders, including the private sector and the relevant government ministry. I think they are in the process of making a law which will include all these issues. Further, he elaborated that how the e blocking and filtering is, is an answer or not when most of the thing is accessible through VPN and interplanetary file system and Google Translate. So this is a challenge again, whether 
up to what extent we can block any content or filter if possible. Next, we, Mr. Akinori Mayamura, made a Japanese case study. On the recent, in the 2007, they had a rise of Manga Mura, the piracy site of Manga, which has created a lot of flutter and the outrage in the society. And in that, the cabinet decided to have an anti-piracy measures, how to curtail this kind of pirated sites of Manga. So task force was formed to countermeasure this kind of thing. They had, a, uh, I think, 16 or 18 members, two from academia, six from juries, intellectual property, telecom authority, and the uh, civil society, and the telcos. But all these members had a seven or eight meetings. But at the end of the day, the members were divided whether to block it or not to block it. So they were not unanimous for any coming out of any report on this. So ultimately, it was decided there should be no report. Because if they thought if they, even if they come out with a report, then the diet their parliament will take the uh, pro kind of attitude, and they may block the contents and all that. So this, again, rose the issue of they go into the fundamentals of the, what is available in their constitution, like secrecy of communication, Article 21, and the, and the other one is the how to longer term measures to contain the piracy, like using the DRMs, moral education, enforcement of good content. So these things have given rise to, a, again, thinking in the society and they thought that secrecy of communication will not be violated. Whatever way the content has to be there, it needs to be done in a other way around. Then we have a Suman Ahmed Sabir made a presentation on what are the things motivating the content to be blocked, like child online protection, religious beliefs, cultural taste, political motivation, fake news. These are the basic tenets where you know things are need to be curtailed. These are happening in the national level, at the ISP level, the local and the end user level. ISP level for the uh, region and the local at the campus areas. And these filtering and content blocking is happening at the prefix filtering, URL, URI filtering, deep pocket inspection level, starvation of bandwidth, destination IP, DNS based filtering, shutdown and denial of access. He cited many examples where a lot of requests have gone to the Google by the government agencies across the nations requesting more and more content to be blocked, more and more. And he cited another example of many countries in Asia having a lot of shutdowns are happening left and right without thinking what is the effect of these on the consumers and the society. Then he made out the point of technologies evolving every moment, but can we solve these issues? Whether really we can, because whenever we go for a curtailing any con particular content, that it, it is not that particular content, but even more larger number of contents are blocked. So whether filtering or blocking is an effective mechanism. Rajneesh Singh from ISOC talked about how the power shift is happening from the political class to the internet, how the shift, because the earlier the political class want have all the powers, now that is reaching to the internet and community-based. The root cause comes when we try to control that internet. So he suggested the ways that dialogue is the only way to needs to happen with the governments, which are constantly changing, dynamically changing, and needs to educate them continuously why, it does, why the system doesn't work if you try to control the thing. I saw cited an example of a on, child online policies mapping and report done in the AP region, where there were light, uh, large variations in the age definition at how you define the age, how you say the child is, what age needs to be protected. So he, he said that when there is a not unanimity in single particular issue in the online uh, policies of the child protection, then how can there be a, not be a variation in many of the issues which are there in the society? So he, he suggested to have a more transparency and consultation process 
for any blocking and filtering to be made in the system. Sapish Babu made a presentation from the end user perspective. He went to the fundamentals, whether what basically is content blocking, filtering or censoring, which is taken in a different context. Whether we want to limit the access to the content, but not its physical removal. So these are two aspects. These are basically based on the content, illegal content, pornography, hate speech, copyright infringement, etc. These are a highly variable and subjective terms which may vary from society to society, in country to country. Most of the technical solutions ultimately undermine the security and stability of the internet because of unintended consequences and side effects. End user is badly impacted because he doesn't know what is happening around, whether he's, why he's not getting certain sites, why he's not getting certain uh, uh, areas where he needs to get the information. Solutions exist to bypass or to sidestep, but there are implications of cost, performance, conflict with law enforcement agencies, etc. So there, even if we block certain things, there are large consequences of that on the overall stability of the internet. So there is a need for consultative process by the government to take the citizens and civil societies organizations into confidence. So I'm summarizing here that internet content blocking and filtering is a reality now. There is a wide variation in type and variety of the content depending upon the context and how we define it. Need to work with conflicting requirements of users, service providers, technical network community, policy makers from the point of view of compliance, especially with the governments. There was the intervention by Mr. Brijesh Jain, Mr. Pankaj Chaturvedi, Colonel Parhar, and Paul Wilson. And one of the points emerged was the Manila principles are quite relevant if the intermediary principles are to be seen in this context. Way forward maybe to have an educate, education, dialogue, collaboration, cooperation within the multi-stakeholder environment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Govind. So I would like uh, to thank the EC and the ethnic community and staff for uh, posing faith on me for this cooperation chair for the last uh, couple of years. And I remember how in the beginning it was not formed in a proper format. It was in a working group format where Aftab and other ISP members were there. And then it was difficult to steer this in terms of topic decision and what format it should take. And hopefully, I think now it has reached a stage where we can streamline with the multiple themes and work with the community. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Govind. Um, on, you know, as you already said, uh, you steered the four-person uh, SIG from the very beginning uh, when you were part of the working groups and then uh, the first uh, four-person SIG chair. So thank you very much for your long contribution. And uh, thank you for bringing it along here uh, all the way. And then, um, you know, I hope uh, we can continue having more interaction with you and learn from your expertise. Uh, thank you very much. A uh, big round of applause for Dr. Govind, please. Thank you. As I've been doing, I'm going to put the other coach here on spot. So, yes. uh, Mr. Joy and Bikram, if you could stand up. Uh, Joy Chen. And, uh, Joy yeah. Chen and the new chair, and uh, Bikram, the coach here. Thank you to you as well. <laughs> Prajesh Ji, I'll have to tell you to come back in the next open mic, please, <laughs> uh, because we are kind of short of time now. Very quick one. <laughs> uh, is to relevant to cooperation? Yes. Yes, okay. Okay, quick one, only quick. one. Uh, thank you. Uh, Bajesh Jain, uh, there are two things which emerged from Akinori. Uh, number one, blocking at the source. And second thing emerged in the summary also engaged with the government. Cooperation SIG started with the public policy. And in Colombo, we had the benefit of some senior security guys coming and presenting their needs and their requirements. Over the time, we seem to have 
lost that edge for coordinating or with the governments. So I would suggest that cooperation somehow involves the administrations with more active participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you once again, uh, Dr. Govind. Okay. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, uh, Sunny. <coughs> um, I'll who is going to do a couple of things. Uh, he's going to first present the APNIC uh, hackathon report, uh, followed by uh, some uh, housekeeping announcements. Uh. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, all. Um, so as Paul mentioned in his report, uh, the, we had a first hackathon in uh, last April at Kathmandu. Uh, that was a great success, and we received a very good feedback to continue these hackathons. Um, I would like to uh, take a moment of uh, opportunity here to thank uh, Vesna from RIPE NCC for helping us uh, in the first hackathon. She did a great job, really. You know, We didn't know anything, how to start and where to go and what to do. And she was mentoring us from the beginning. And she was even on site at Apricot and uh, helping through the session. So we have learned uh, some of it from her. And we are still learning uh, how to organize these hackathons. So this is the second one we did uh, here at uh, Apricot. Um, uh, we really thank uh, Facebook for sponsoring uh, this hackathon, and we hope uh, more organizations will come forward to support us in this activity in the future. We had three sessions. Uh, we started uh, on Friday, 22nd, 7 PM. That's right after the workshops were completed, finished. And, um, we did a brainstorming session, introductions, you know, getting to know each other on that uh, night. And then the following day, the f uh, one day, full day, you know, the participants got together. Uh, they split into teams and uh, they started working on the hackathon. Um, though it says, you know, they worked from 9 to 6, but they actually were in the room until around 11 p.m. Uh, the, you can see the enthusiasm of the participants, you know, they wanted to sit and complete the project because on the following day, uh, they had to do the presentation to the jury members um, and uh, finish off their work. So the topic this time was a drum. Uh, my colleagues Sophia and GGM came up with this. Uh, it's basically about uh, related to what we do, APNIC uh, activities, um, in terms of distributing the IP addresses, you know, how they get routed and how they use. Um, so uh, it was challenging for the participants uh, because this is something uh, different than uh, what other hackathons usually are. Uh, and the last year we did IPv6, it was a little bit easier, but this time it was challenging. But we provided, Sophia and GGM and all the jury members, uh, they all provided uh, good guidance. Uh, they mentored them throughout the hackathon, so they are on track in what they want to achieve. So we have jury members, um, quite a long list here, and uh, as you can see, the jury members are also interested to support this hackathon from various uh, fields, various expertise. Um, so we thank all the jury members for their time and effort uh, for supporting a hackathon, and also we hope that uh, some of them will f support our future hackathons too. We had 16 participants. We opened the application. Uh, though it was a little late in the process, but uh, we still received quite a number of applications, and the jury selected uh, 16 of them, uh, 12 male and 4 female, and they all come from uh, 11 individual economies. And we had about four uh, participants from South Korea as well. So the brainstorming session, you know, we put out some topics and we put out some um, ideas out there, and they have shortlisted. Um, they actually shortlisted six uh, topics uh, and on Friday night. And when they came back on sun Saturday morning, uh, I think they did um, discuss uh, among themselves and they merged uh, two topics. So we ended up having five teams with five, five individual topics. I'm not going to go through it. Uh, you can read them. And also, we published a blog post. There is a link. Uh, you can uh, look at the blog post. Uh, there's a couple of videos as well from the participants. Um, very interesting to watch, really. At the end of the hackathon on Sunday, the jury members had a tough time selecting a winner. But uh, we have to select a winner to give out the prizes. So outage correlation was the, the project that the jury selected. 
Um, their main goal was to understand relation between the BGP outages, find anomalies and that may have caused outages. And they actually did a live um, a demo of uh, what they achieved in that one and a half days. So that was really great. Um, and also, as you can see, there's three members in the team. Uh, they all come from different economies. One is from uh, the one standing right next to Gaurav is from Philippines and uh, Mongolia and uh, Korea. And they had a really challenging uh, to understand each other because of the language barrier. So they were using Google Translator to talk to each other. Uh, that was really impressive, you know, how they communicated and achieved this project in, within that one and a half days time. And we also really thank uh, Gaurav for being there uh, on Sunday uh, to, to, for the closing ceremony of the hackathon and uh, um, giving a small speech as well, encouraging all the participants to participate more in these hackathons. So this is a group photo of all the 16 uh, participants uh, along with the jury members and the moderators. Um, and you will find more photos on our Flickr account later during this, uh, after this conference. So that's about it, about the hackathon. Any questions I can answer? Otherwise, um, my other two jobs, yes? The other two jobs um, is the, about uh, the closing dinner tonight. Um, the buses will depart at 6.30 p.m. from this location to the venue. Um, and there is a limited capacity, 300 uh, seats only. So on first come first, uh, got into the bus, we'll get the seat. And the buses will depart, come back from the uh, social dinner venue back to this location uh, from 9.30 p.m. onwards. So if, if you're joining, we hope you're all joining the closing dinner. Uh, be early to get on the bus, to go to the social dinner, have a great night, and then come back safely, please. The other reminder, um, the ballot box is still open. You can still collect your ballots. Uh, it will close at 2.30 p.m. sharp. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Sunny. Uh, as uh, Sunny said, uh, I was fortunate enough to go to the tail end of the hackathon uh, and was really exciting to see uh, the work being done and uh, the work being produced uh, in the short time frame. Uh, thank you for Sunny to coordinating it, the jury members, and also the sponsor uh, for doing that for us. Um, we, Sunny already did the housekeeping announcements. Uh, we have four minutes, uh, so I will open up the mic for a minute or two if anybody has anything to add or say. Um, if not, uh, then we'll break for lunch. And as Sunny reminded, uh, two items, the social event tonight and the voting. Uh, we'll see you here in an hour and a half uh, at uh, 2.30. Uh, lunch is at the user location downstairs, Sunny. Yeah, the lunch is at the user location downstairs uh, over there in the corner. So see you at 2.30. Thank you.